who's doing this video. I um I don't know about that. Here, you're on my space. Ah. First of all, David. Dave in Ireland. I promise I'm not gonna sit on him. That's why I have this stool here, so there's there's no means plus they're just sitting here for demonstration purposes. Um, I have four topics. Four. Uno, dos, tres, cuatro topics. Eins, zwei, drei, vier topics. Um, the last video of January 2020. And so I figured I'm going to give um, something to the world uh, that will appeal to everyone. I've got a variety of things. First of all, sinew. And there are basically two types of sinew out there. There is back strap, which is that long stuff that runs along the back strap. And it's, it's a thin sheet. And it, it differs, well, it's similar to the tendons that you get in the ankles uh, of deer, the Achilles tendons. It's, it's similar in that it's uh, sinew. It's incredibly strong, has the same you know, properties and stuff, but it differs that it's longer and it's thinner. It isn't this round thing that you have to crack open like a walnut with a hammer and then peel it apart. There are also some differences in when you're using them. The, the leg tendons, those hard little dry white sausages, you pound them with a hammer or smooth rocks. I, I use both. If it's summertime, I'll be out there underneath my spruce tree. I've got my pounding rock for sinew. So I'm I'm preparing it with rocks. I have a smooth, round one that very well could have been an actual native, native um, sinew pounding or whatever pounding rock that I found. This, on the other hand, I don't pound it. And this goes along with the differences in when you're using them. Uh, either, it wouldn't be this because this is rounded. There was a rounded edge on this, but a countertop works really well where you just do this and it scrapes off the minor sheathing and it also separates the fibers. I also use, gosh I made this 10 years ago, you can see the little tiny nails in there, little copper flashing nails. I pre-drilled this nice oak thing, ergonomic, and made this comb. And I'm not going to do a lot of it because it makes all the stuff and I just vacuum the carpet. But how you operate this thing is you simply, uh, I'll start in this and you poke it through there and you comb it. You know, and, and you can make a little metal cone. That's enough. I don't feel like vacuuming again. But you can see it, see it starts separating them. And after you comb it out, you can take, you know, the same stuff, run it over a countertop, or just scrape it with your thumbnail, and you get a cleaning of that sheath. Now, these operate different when you dip them in hide glue because they weren't pounded. They weren't flufferized. They weren't made fluffy. They're individual, yes, it has been reduced, but it hasn't been pounded to a point where it absorbs glue very easy. Now, the, the visual difference is that it's a little stringier looking when it's on the bow, and I'll show you right here. It's, it's different looking than pounded leg tendons. It's more stringy. You can see the individual fibers. And from an artistic standpoint, you can blend them. Now, when I've made my ultimate horse bow, you know, gull wing, and then it's, it's not accurate for the style, I would do that V-notch and then bend up the tips so it looks like a West Coast paddle bow. Um, the one advantage is if you have a long, if it's an Osage or Mulberry, you can get an incredible bend radius in it, and you don't want the string to slip off the tips, and having the tips kick up, keeps the string from sliding up. But that notwithstanding, I would have leg tendons backing it. And it makes a nice layer, especially when you wrap it and you compress it. Then I would use um, backstrap sinew because you can see the difference in it. You can see the difference between that leg tendon, fluffy stuff put down, very easy glue absorbing, and the wraps. I would use American bison, buffalo back strap, which is longer than white tail, and then between the middle and wraps and the handle, and then this area, I would make X wraps on it. So there'd be an X here and an X here. And the con contrast between that back strap 
send you the X patterns on there. And the, the backing, which was leg, which is a little smoother and you don't see the individual fibers, makes a really beautiful contrast. On the tips, I'd go so far I'd sand a uh, small rectangular, rectangular sheet of, of deer rawhide, sand it paper thin, paper thin, soak it in hide glue, and then wrap the tips, wrap it with string around there to keep it bonded down, and then actually put this bowstring on there, and then block it up here between the handle. It wasn't braced, it was just, you know, tightened, so the bowstring would like force its way in there and it would make a really nice fit. Cushion it, sinew strings go on those bows that I make, and so you want to cushion it and make it round and and so it doesn't wear away that natural fiber string. That was a big investment in time and materials. But anyway, this is that. Now, what does that have to do with the price of tea in China? Well, my friends, this is where, when I'm doing a wrapping with this stuff, it doesn't absorb the glue very easily. Um, in the case of last night when I wrapped these tips, I used a thinner glue mixture. You're not committing your glue pot to thin because you can just leave it on the, the stove uncovered, it'll evaporate and get thicker, you know, so you can adjust the viscosity of your glue. But I use thinner glue, and I don't just dip it in the glue for 20 seconds like I do fluffy leg tendons, it's just whoosh, absorb the glue in there soft. This has to soak for a while. I'll make for this, it's not just one wide thing that I wrap it, it's wrap, and then another group of bundles, to make it go all the way up. Three bundles, one wrap, made about this far, and I start down here because as you pull them, it wants to go this way towards the handle, then the second bundle, then the third bundle. Um, it makes it more consistent than trying to have a big thick one there. Anyway, moving right along, the problem with this stuff, it didn't absorb the glue that much, and so I continue allowing it to absorb when it's on the tip. How do I do that? This is within your technology. A pair of scissors and a garbage bag. I will, whenever I'm doing the wrappings on things, especially if the bow has been dried, because I do not do my wraps on a freshly backed bow, because that backing will shrink down and it doesn't work out to where this will be just gripping it tightly because this gets smaller as the backing dries. And then if you did your wraps at the same time, it just it wouldn't work out well. You can do it, but if you're persnickety like me, sorry for the rough language, you want to make sure that it's the best it can be. Putting the wraps on an already dried back, you have to use this. You really do. It works so well. A strip of this, and you're saying, I'm retarding the drying. Well, yeah, that's the point. Wrap that nice and good. It's going to dry very slowly. It's going to give that send you a chance to melt. I use that term, it doesn't literally melt into the back, but I refer to melting as gluing so strong. So if you were to not have your tips already made and you wrapped your tips and if it wasn't on there and you went to put your string grooves in, it's gonna peel up where it cuts through it. You use this method, oh buddy, and get it sloshy with that thin glue after you do that. Um, after you, or before you wrap it, and it's gonna bond so well. And you could cut through that stuff, you could cut through fibers, and that wrapping will not come off. That is super wrapping. Look at this. I keep saying, you can do it. You can do this. Who out there amongst you cannot do this? Everyone that's watching this can do that. Let it sit overnight. And when you unwrap it in the morning, man, that stuff is smooth. You don't have the little ends peeking up because that compresses them down. I go a step further because I don't want to have, it's inevitable that there's going to be a little, when you're looking at this when it's dry, a little, I'm going to exaggerate this so you can see it, a little humping. You wrap it. Works the same way I'm backing here. Um, when you first back the bow, you don't need to use plastic, just use gauze. But you wrap it once, just wait. You wrap it once, at a moderate pressure, depending on your ability to maintain an even pressure so you're not sliding it back and forth. Now I've gotten to the point when I'm using gauze that I can actually wrap it in this way and have the sinew and stuff 
go the opposite way that you would think it would just by maintaining and changing pressure because that gauze is elastic. But the back is wrapped with gauze or you wrap the tips here. Take your Wizard of Oz commemorative 50th anniversary glass that you got at Wendy's or something and squish it down, even it out. No sanding involved here, my friends. This works better than sanding. You're not cutting any fibers, um, but yeah, you are smoothing it. If you were doing this over gauze, doesn't need to be plastic on the back, and I'm not gonna do it because it's, I don't want to risk this by scratching it or anything. If you were to do this after you gauze wrapped it, uh, it would be so smooth afterwards um, that you wouldn't even need to sand if you wanted to snake skin back the rawhide or the sinew. How long do you wait before you snake skin back? Well, snake skin is a vapor barrier. It's a skin, so it's permeable, but it is yet a vapor barrier. So do not sinew back your bow and then just stick the snake skin on it. It's going to be a rotten, nasty ball, and it's going to dry really slowly. Do not do it the next day. Don't do it the next week. Patience and sinew backing. That sinew can be dry in two, three weeks, but it is not cured, and it's still going to lose some moisture and quibble it. I, I can't speak. And do other magical things. And so wait. Wait, wait, wait. You know, until you put the snake skin on. It's going to add moisture. Boom. You don't need to wrap it. I never wrap snake skin when I'm putting it on sinew. It's just not necessary because you can just stick it and it's stuck. Um, wait until the last minute. Yes, you added moisture when you snake skin back, but it's just surface moisture. It didn't soak in all the way. And so you don't need to wait another two months after you put the snake skin on it. Wait another couple weeks. Again, when you think it's done, wait a little longer. Forget about it. Put it in the corner. Put it somewhere else. Forget about your bow. Can you bake it if you have a wood stove at your house can you put that sinew back or sinew wrap or whatever bowl up there on racks above your uh wood heater your wood stove yep but i would wait until it's gone into reflex before i started baking it i, I do that a lot i have you know a friend that has a wood stove with drying racks and i'll just take a sinew back bowl after a month take it to tech's house put it on the racks and forget about it you know, the longer the better. And that is that. You are now masters of sinew backing. I'm going to make sure this thing is still running. Yep, still recording. Topic two, tone chasing. Now, of course, you know, if you're playing this, I'm not going to take this to a luthier and have a, have a, a pickup in it. It's, there's a mic right here and I can adjust the tone, you know, when I'm playing. This is the tone I want. And I get that through a microphone. That's a mystery song. Guess what that is, my pretties. But, in the case of this, I am chasing tones. In our group, which, uh, wow, this month, we're doing two, two gigs, um, three hours long, and I am the lead guitarist on this. Uh, the other person is a rhythm guitarist who plays an acoustic electric uh, six string, and so I'm chasing tones on that, and we do a, a lot of original things, but a few covers. Um, I am doing uh, like a Pink Floyd cover, and then Buffalo Springfield and stuff like that, mostly original. But I like a bass amp with this. I'm using currently my Orange Crush bass combo amp. And it works well with that. I don't like trebly. I like to get the low and the mid ranges, you know, and filter out the high piercing violin sounds. But currently I have this. Um, this is a chorus pedal. And I just, on eBay, for those music files out there, Eli. Um, picked up for $34, handmade in Canada. It's a clone of a of a, a tube screamer. But the nice thing is that it has a switch that flips between a TS-808 and a TS-9. 
Now, with my amps, you know, I've got a clean sound. A violin is a little different than a guitar, you know, as far as, uh, what would you say, hitting the gain and all that stuff. It works a little different, so I have to rely really on pedals to get that. Now, I've got another bass amp. I'm going to impress you. <laughs> Silvertone. This miracle wonder of technology came with uh, a cheap bass, actually the Bambi caster, the one I covered with deer rawhide and then wood burned and painted a feather into it. This is actually a 26 watt bass amp, if you can believe it. And being a bass amp, I like it with my violin, electric violin, go figure. I just like the tone better with bass amps. This thing has a nice clean tone. It doesn't have any tone shaping or anything, but my goal is to take that clone of a tube screamer and run it through this, because how great is this? Having to carry this around. I feel bad for like the keyboard player because she has this big old keyboard and then a synthesizer, all this stuff, multiple microphones. And I'll just like to have my mandolin, my electric violin, and this. And so we're going to see. I tried to take it apart to see if I can put a bigger speaker in it, but then, or a better speaker, but you know, really, for what it is, uh, it's a nice little amp, good clean tone, and hopefully with the, the tube screamer, I will be able to do a little tone shaping, get a little bit of grunge into my violin playing. Next topic, um, diet, okay, I am married, and happy wife, happy life, and she brought up this thing, it's February, you know, so why not do something different, there's a, a what the heck is the name of this doctor? There's so many doctors on the internet now. But he has this idea. It's like fruit and vegetable, vegetable based, like 28 day plan to rid your body of all sorts of horrible things. Pestilences, scourges and whatnot. It's like, I'm a fruit bad. I love fruit, I love vegetables. Why not, I'm gonna try it. And then afterwards, you know, if things work out, I like it. Um, you know, grate a little bit of meat into it, fish. Hopefully this will be a big fishing year for me. But we'll see. I'm committing. Tomorrow, February 1st, I'm going to begin this. It's actually vegan and raw. And so we're going to see. And organic. So let's see how it is. A lot of pumpkins, um, winter squashes, uh, spinach, you know. One of my favorite things, walnuts in moderation. A lot of smoothies. We'll see. Let's see if I return back to my... my highly toned cat-like body here so if you can follow that if I'm still alive in 28 days and if I do well hey you know give it a try we can always eat more vegetables and fruit and you don't have to hold a gun to my head you can't do that in Virginia anymore obviously um, don't have to hold a gun to my head to make mango smoothies oh yeah last up a book idea now I've been Puzzling. What am I going to do for my second book? Of course, I've got a list of things. Arrow making, you know, would be a big one like that. And maybe more tips on, on sinew, which I didn't include in the first one. However, I was thinking, in the response to a comment I had and an answer I gave, a person asked me a question. It was regarding sinew backing. And I responded, and he said, thank you, because there's not a lot of information on that that I can, or any information you can find in books. And a light bulb went over my, off in my head. It's like, what do you want to know about bow making and various techniques, including, you know, this stuff? And it's like, you've already told me. If I go, if I mine my comments throughout my YouTube career, it touches upon everything. Um, specific wood questions, sinew questions that I didn't answer, you know, you had a question regarding something and I answered it. And so I may use that as the second um, book's topic, is like mining all the questions, all the good pertinent questions on my YouTube videos throughout and, and just question and answering and need be, which will probably be the case, I'll have diagrams and sketches and stuff like that to help out, I think that's a good idea. Instead of guessing and just writing a book, you know, this is what I think you want to know, I'm going to find out what you want to know. All the questions are right there. My book is sitting in the comment section of my video. And that is that.
I think. But that is about it. I'm actually surprised that the string is saying that this is still sitting here. Nobody's called for it. It's a beautiful, beautiful bow, and you can see the richness of the oak and also the chevrons, which I've been harping about, like a topo mat. Definitely. It's a board bow. I'm not going to lie to you, but you can't tell the difference between this and a stave made bow. I think I've braced a little bit high, but whatever. Man, that's good. A nice bow. Yeah, it's a little higher for my taste, but why not? I, I love this thing and that channel right there. The detail work. This is a beautiful bow. I was out there stump shooting a couple days ago in long range shooting, like 50 yard signs, trying to hit posts that were sticking out of the ground. But there it is. Plus it comes with an arrow. And I was debating, because it's going to be with this bow, I made black between the feathers and then a copper, a copper ring, maybe black and then another copper one to match the bow. That is it. You have suffered through multiple topics. Hopefully you've gleaned some useful information. That is all.